I think that the first obligation, the first step towards grappling with dirty work, it's like moral courage. You have to exercise it. You have to build up a willingness to do it. And I think just knowledge, the willingness to see these connections, to acknowledge them and to talk about the fact that these things are happening. Because once we stop talking about them, we've accepted it. I'm Ron Dror, and this is Remake, a podcast about design, systems, and society. In each episode, I talk to someone who's trying to change our lives for the better, in some meaningful way, whether through a new product, new venture, or a new way of looking at the world. And I try to understand how they came to it, what makes them tick, and what we can learn from them. Today, I'm talking to Eyal Press. Eyal is a regular contributor to The New Yorker and The New York Times. His most recent book is Dirty Work, Essential Jobs and the Hidden Toll of Inequality in America, which won the 2022 Hillman Prize and was named a New York Times notable book. He's also the host of the podcast Primary Sources. We spoke in mid-June 2022, and I was excited to talk to Eyal after getting hold of his book, Dirty Work, which covers the ethically questionable, psychologically damaging work society delegates to marginalized, far away, or hidden workers. An example of this would be killer drone operators who sit in a safe command center in the U.S. while killing people remotely on the ground in the Middle East, and the complexities of the systems we create to keep those jobs hidden and far away and removed from from the so-called good people. I found the conversation fascinating and challenging. We talked about him growing up as the son and grandson of Holocaust survivors and the perspective it gave him, the rarity of people who take moral stand in the face of bad consequences, what Everett Hughes had to say about the people who keep themselves clean and good while knowingly ignoring horrors done in their name, the character of dirty work and the systemic structures that make it persist. We then dive into particular examples such as prison systems in the U.S., drone warfare as an imagined way to clean up war, things that Americans consume that have dirty work behind them. We talk about moral injury and how unethical jobs can over time create real injury, psychological harm to the people performing them. The invisibility of dirty work. What can we do to clean up dirty work? And we dive into the Israeli occupation of Palestine, and the extent to which Israeli society is delegating the dirty work of occupation to soldiers and military police, and the ways in which civil organizations like Breaking the Silence are trying to counteract that tendency. It's impossible to talk to Eyal and not think about the places where I might be exporting unpleasant or unethical work to invisible hands while still benefiting from their work. And it's been useful to think about what I can do in these situations. Eyal provided a valuable and challenging framework to think about the world we live in and what's truly necessary to make it better. Not only keep our own hands clean, but raising awareness and reforming systems that fund and perpetuate morally injurious work out of the sight of so-called good people. This conversation is one of a dozen or so weekly conversations we already have lined up for you with thinkers, authors, scientists, designers, makers, and entrepreneurs who are working to change our world for the better. So follow this podcast on your favorite podcast app or head over to remakepod.org to subscribe. And now let's jump right in with Eyal Press. All right. I'm sitting here with Eyal Press. Eyal, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Great to be here. So I know you uh, spend your time in New York, and usually these days we we do kind of a world check-in. So it started as a COVID check-in, and now it's, you know, the world keeps changing. So what is it like to be you in the world today? Well, you know, New York is experiencing a glorious early summer. It sort of was cold all spring, but it's been 70 or 80 degrees, which without all the humidity that I think visitors know if they've come in the summer, the city has revived. Certainly it's been a, it's been a tough stretch of two and a half years now, 
the pandemic was really brutal for a city that relies on collective public gatherings. This city has been through a lot. I've lived here when 9-11 happened, saw a lot of people leave saying, no one's going to want to live in New York in the future. Lived through the pandemic uh, the first year where I think a lot of people thought the same. And New York's always going to be New York. It's lively, it's bustling, and it's back on its feet. Yeah, I see a lot of um, photos on Facebook now from friends in New York who are going to shows and live concerts. And, you know, it definitely seems like it's back. So we like to start these explorations, getting to know the person before kind of looking at the, the, their work and their projects. And so the opening questions I always ask is, what's something you learned in childhood or early in life that's still alive in you today, that still drives or guides you today? It's hard to pinpoint one thing, but certainly I think that I am the grandson and the son of Holocaust survivors. My maternal grandparents were from Chernovitz, which was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and of course collapsed as so much of Europe did during World War II. And the Jews from Chernovitz were taken to camps in Transnistria, which has been in the news lately. And my mother was actually born in that camp. She was, as far as we know, the first child born in that camp. She was blessed by a rabbi who said she would have a long life. And that rabbi has been proven correct. But these were not things that were ever talked about in the terms I'm talking about them now when I grew up and when I was a child. But I knew them in some sort of Mm. different way. There's a kind of process of osmosis, I think, that you sort of know, okay, there's a history here of very large events that happened. And I didn't realize that would shape the kind of writing I did or the kind of career I would have really until well, well, well into it. I think that's very common in, in families that have tragic and very big historical events in the background. You don't necessarily have to talk about them to absorb their meaning. Mm. That connects us quite nicely to uh, the story of, of Everett Hughes. Tell me this story and how it connected with where you're coming from. Did it connect with you yeah. when you read it? Very much. Um, so because of the background, the history, the family history that I just mentioned, I think questions of ethics and questions of how to navigate extreme conditions, extreme situations, has always fascinated me and has in one way or another been the thing I've written about. I've now written three books and in different ways, I realize now they all grapple with that question. And When Mm. it came to Everett Hughes, so I think I should give a little bit of background before getting to Hughes on my previous book. I had written a book called Beautiful Souls. It's a German phrase originally. I knew it in Hebrew before I knew it in English as Yafe Nefesh. It's a book about moral courage. It's a book about people who don't want to dirty their hands because if they follow the orders they're given or the commands of their community, they feel they will violate their principles, their values. And so I looked at four real people in different historical eras, starting in World War II and tracing right up to the present, who stood by what they believed and paid a very dear price for this. The Mm -hmm. the book opens with a Swiss border guard who decides to allow Jews into Switzerland right after he's attended a conference telling him, don't allow them in. This is the new policy. We can't, mm. we can't let them in. And um, he pays mm. for this with his career. He's stripped of his uniform. He dies in penury. He's now considered a hero, but it took decades mm. after these events occurred. His name is Paul Gruninger. And so the kind of questions I grappled with in Beautiful Souls have really stayed with me. But in that book, I wrote about, in a sense, the purists, right? The people who were able to say, you know, I won't do this. And one of the things Mm. that I learned in the course of writing that book and grappling with these stories is that these are the exceptions. Most of us faced with really grave costs, a loss of career, a loss of prestige, a loss of communal support and acceptance from neighbors. We don't want to face those things. And it takes a lot to be willing to give those things up. And as I was writing that book, 
I was meeting people. There's a chapter of the book set in the Balkans, and I write about someone who refused to attack and harm a neighbor because they were of a different ethnic group. And this, of course, is what happened mm. in the former Yugoslavia, the entire country divided into ethnic groups. This person said, no, I'm not going to do that, and was really banished for that reason. And when I was there, I met guys in their 40s who had been 18, 19, 20 years old when this all happened. And they had gone along with it because they were kids. They were young men, and they were told, you have to defend if you're a Serb, your fellow Serbs, you have to defend, if you're a Croat, your fellow Croats, and the enemy is the other group. And they went along, and I could see how broken they were by this experience. And when I heard them, there was one night in particular, we were at a bar talking, just hearing mm. hearing their stories about the war. And I have to say, there was a part of me that was secretly judging them as I was hearing these stories. Like, my God, how could you have done this? It's, these terrible deeds. But another part of me identified with them and felt, how different would I have acted in this situation? And mm. uh, it was that experience that led me to want to write about people who did dirty their hands, not because they were horrible people, not because they wanted to harm others or do evil, but because systems and structures of incentives were really powerfully aligned to make those mm. bad choices very human, very predictable, very understandable, even as the consequences are extremely lamentable. And that interested mm. me a lot. And it led me to the essay you mentioned by Everett Hughes as I was trying to understand this dynamic and, and how it works. Yeah, so, so Everett Hughes... He's in Germany, right? He's an American sociologist doing research work in Germany. So t tell me what he found out. What was, what was it that you connected with? Yeah, he goes there right after World War II to teach a semester abroad. And Everett Hughes was a sociologist at the University of Chicago. He had been to Germany before World War II. And the people he knew were architects and artists and very creative professionals and fellow professors, people of his social milieu, very liberal-minded, very tolerant. And he corresponded with them. I learned all of this by reading his diaries. He kept up a correspondence with them. And then the war happens, mm. and he loses touch with a lot of them. And he goes back to Germany after World War II. And of course, he's curious. He wants to know what became of those people? Most of them had stayed in Germany during the war. And that made him doubly curious. How could these, as he thought of them, good people have stayed there and not, I tried to leave the country or protest or, or, you know, he wanted to know how they would describe and talk about the horrors that had transpired during the war, and particularly the Holocaust and the Nazi regime. Now, no one wanted to talk about it. That's one of the things he discovered, right? It was sort of <laughs> this verboten topic. But one night, Hughes goes and has tea at the home of a German architect. This is in Frankfurt. There are a couple other educated types there, Germans. And they say to him, one of them says to him, the American soldiers who are here are very rude. I'm paraphrasing, but this is basically what he's told. And Hughes takes the opportunity to say, what do you make of the comportment of German soldiers during the war? He opens this topic of what the German soldiers did to Jews and others during the war. And the host, the architect, immediately says, which is the thing you would expect, is that he's ashamed of this. Uh. And that, of course, he has nothing to do with it. He didn't approve it. And it's a source of pain and shame and so forth. But then he goes on uh. to say, the Jews, they really were a problem. Uh, you know, they came here, they took all the good jobs. They gathered in these filthy ghettos. Uh, they were 10 to 1 in law and medicine and so forth. And Hughes just sort of observes this rhetoric, this kind of talk, and he records it uh. in his diary. And then he proceeds to keep hearing this kind of on the one hand, on the other hand. On the one hand, that's terrible. We're ashamed of it. On the other hand, to those Jews, they really were a problem. And out of uh. this 
comes an essay that really informed my book. It's titled Good People and Dirty Work. And um, mm. in this essay, Hughes describes that encounter with the architect. And what he says is that the these two things, the good people that he knew and folks like that architect and the dirty work by which he is referring to the mass atrocities perpetrated by the Nazis, that these two things are not separate, that there is some connection between them. And the connection he posits is that the good people were tacitly condoning what the Nazis did, not explicitly approving of it, but tacitly condoning it because they saw the Jews as a problem. They didn't see them as just fellow citizens who deserve the same rights as everyone else. And they were kind of bothered by these people. And so mm. once a government came to power that took care of this problem, they were willing to turn a blind eye. They were willing to stop talking about it and to accept it because at some level, they didn't mind so much and they didn't want to ask the questions. It's a very provocative and disturbing essay. But the important thing and the interesting thing is Hughes is a sociologist. He's not a historian of Germany. And he says this explicitly. He's interested in systems. He's interested mm. in how societies organize the unethical things that go on. And he says in that essay that this dynamic between the good people and the dirty work exists in every society, that everywhere you go, you will be able to find, albeit of course less extreme forms of dirty work, that society has tacitly condoned and delegated for other people to do. So they don't have to dirty their hands themselves, but someone else will take care of the problem, so to speak. And it was that insight that led me to think, I want to write a book called Dirty Work, and I want to raise the same questions that Hughes raised, but raise them in the context of the contemporary United States where I live. And that's yeah. what I did. And so, you know, as, as, as an Israeli, this immediately leads me to think about my society where I grew up, where, you know, I think there's there's the dirty work of the occupation and how we manage that and the people who do the very unpleasant work on the ground, whereas the rest of us talk about the two-state solution and how we still believe in it, but we're not actually letting it happen. I think I'm gonna, we, we want to maybe circle back to it. So let's first understand the thesis of this book and the structure of this book, because you cover all of these very real dirty jobs and the experience of, of, the, of those people and how society hides those people away from sight. You know, how is this book constructed? What was that journey of making, the, like, making this book? Yeah, structure in this book is very important. First of all, the structural analysis that Hughes just provided. There are certain key themes that repeat. One of the key things is that he suggests that we either hide these unpleasant activities or that society lacks what he calls the will to know about them. We could go online and search for articles about the occupation right. or whatever, whatever particular example you want to give. But we don't really want to dwell on these matters. So we don't. One structural factor is kind of knowledge and how knowledge is impeded so that we don't actually have to ask ourselves, are we complicit? The other kind of structural thing that Hughes and that I emphasize is that what, what to me is, is beautiful about his theory is that it is not an indictment of the people who are dirtying their hands. It's not that he's saying they're innocent by any stretch, but he's saying it's not enough to point the finger at them and say, ah, you're the bad guys. I'm innocent. And uh -huh. um, there's one very resonant passage in this essay where he imagines a prison guard. This is in 1960, by the way, before America has built the world's largest prison system. But he's imagining a brutal mistreatment of some, some prisoners at a prison. And it gets into the papers and people say, ah, that brutal guard over there, he did it. He's the bad uh -huh. guy. He sort of pictures this guard who he says, you know, may have a penchant for cruelty. Okay, that's possible. But who also may say, you guys are hypocrites. You're telling me 
I'm the bad guy. But mm. what do you really want me to do with these prisoners who are, in effect, outcasts? They are a problem that need to be taken care of. And so they're put behind the walls of the facility where I work. Do you really want me to be nice to them? What kind of message have you actually sent me? And Mm. that is the other structural piece in the book. I'm asking readers to consider the events, these unpleasant things, without the easy impulse to indict the people doing it and to think about the more systemic issues. So then there's the structure and system of organizing the book. And what I felt I wanted to do was to choose a number of examples of dirty work in America that say a lot about the kind of society America is. In other words, Mm. I didn't want to find a form of dirty work that exists in Idaho in a small town and that you won't find anywhere else, right? right? That says very little about someone living in New York or someone living in Boston. I wanted to pinpoint forms of dirty work that I felt are ubiquitous and are quite central to either the way Americans have organized their society or the American way of life. I can go through the different examples, but they all accord with that. Yeah. So there's drone pilots, there's slaughterhouse workers, there's prison guards, and many other examples that walk us through some of these stories so that people sure. can understand. You know, I think it can stay at the level of abstraction, but let's, but let's turn them into real stories. Sure. So the prison story. Prisons are big business in America. America has the largest prison system in the world. More than 2 million Americans are locked up. And that system was built over decades. It's something that as a society, we've begun to question and grapple with. And the phrase mass incarceration these days is criticized on both the left and the right in America as a sort of acknowledgement that we went too far, that this system was out of control. It's how can we have a bigger system, prison system than China? What does that say about us? The mm. largest mental health institutions in the United States are not hospitals. They are not community care centers. Jails and prisons function as effectively as mental health asylums. And in those jails and prisons, you have a vast population of guards who have very little training in dealing with people with severe mental illnesses. And you also have poorly paid and often very compromised psychiatric aides and social workers who are assigned the job of taking care of these folks. And so that's the first part of the book. And I look at, on the one hand, the social workers and the mental health aides, they are dirtying their hands. Why are they dirtying their hands? Because you really can't provide humane care in the setting of a prison. It's just so difficult. One of the fundamental difficulties is that these are institutions that are run by security. And so if the security guards tell you, hey, I'm going to put this guy in solitary. He just said something to me that I don't like. You're the mental health aide. You may think that's wrong. This guy is hallucinating, hearing voices. The last thing in the world we should be doing is putting him in solitary confinement. But you know what? If I say something to the guard the guard may retaliate at me. I need the guard for my own protection to do the work, to be here and feel safe. Mm. And this is called a dual loyalty. The first chapter of the book is called Dual Loyalties. And it's about that kind of dilemma that plays out. And so most of the people who work there, they acquiesce. What security says basically goes. And that does result in departures from medical ethics. But these departures, these violations are systemic. They are perfectly predictable when you look at the structural conditions that have Mm. been created. So that's where the book begins. And the second part of the book, as you mentioned, is about drones, is about imagery analysts and the pilots who Mm. um, carry out drone strikes in the United States. And this is about, again, another very central activity to the United States, namely how we fight our wars. And one of the things I trace in that chapter is that drone warfare had this very alluring aura to it. And the allure was 
this is immaculate war. These are pinpoint strikes. This takes the dirty out of war because right. we just select our targets and there's very little collateral damage and the moral discomfort that we associate with war is largely removed. And what I show and find out is that although that may be true for the good people who stop paying attention to drone strikes, it's not true of the people right. who look at the screens and who choose the targets and who then have to go home having done this for eight, 10 hours at a time because of various other things that arise, not least the fact that it's a very odd thing to be sitting at a computer making decisions that have life and death consequences and not being in a sense on the ground and having your own safety and security at risk. I mean, there are chaplains and psychologists on these drone bases that try to help manage the distress, frankly, that a lot of these folks feel as they're doing this. And one of them told me when you're, he was a Marine, he was in the Marines. And he said, when you're in the Marines and you're on the ground, you know, you feel this camaraderie all around you. And part of that camaraderie is everybody's at risk. If we make a mistake, it could cost my fellow soldier's life. It could cost mine. But it's reciprocal, right, this risk. That's not the case when you're sitting at a computer thousands of miles away and you see these details play out on screen and you mm -hmm. have to live with the decision. But it was not a risk for you. It was a risk for other people. And so that's yeah. one of the moral complexities that I think makes this form of warfare very troubling. So that's that's the second case. Now, both of those examples that I've given deal with public policy in some form. What kind of criminal justice system do Americans want? How do they want to fight their wars? These are things that laws and policies and decisions made by elected officials shape. The other examples in the book go in a different direction. And I talk about things that Americans consume that have dirty work behind them. So mm. that's the example of the industrial slaughterhouse where you're eating a meal, you don't see what went into it, you don't see that an animal was actually killed, it doesn't look like an animal mm. by the time it's come to your dinner plate, but there are people who did see that and who did work in the slaughterhouse on the so-called kill floor. I also look at fossil fuels, uh, folks on oil rigs who drill for oil and, and fossil fuels. When you fill up the gas in your car, you may not think about it very much, but then a spill happens in, on an offshore oil, and everybody says, oh, this industry is so dirty. Mm. What, what a terrible thing. Let me go fill the gas again, right? This kind yeah. of contradiction. So that's the structure of the book, because... I think that it might be possible for readers to read the prison section and the drone section of the book. In fact, readers have written to me and said this and say, okay, that's dirty. That's troubling. But I don't approve of it. I mean, other people may, but I'm not the one who voted for the politicians who said, let's expand the drone program. Or I believe there should be more rehabilitation and less punitive uh, punishment. You can say that in the first parts of the book, but by the time you're in the in the slaughterhouse section, it's a different question. Do you go to McDonald's? Do you eat chicken wings? How much are your own consumption habits wrapped up yeah. in some of these activities? And, and and I'm not even sure you can say that about the drone program because the fact is, whoever you voted for, if it's one of the two large parties, then they both massively increase the use of drones and they both approve of it. And is it enough to also not be involved in doing it? Or should you actually speak up when you hear about it, when you hear about the tragedy? So it's, it's really interesting. So, you know, in, in Buddhism, there's this term of right livelihood, hmm which is one of the, it's the Noble Eightfold Path. It's essentially the path to living a good life and to enlightenment. Uh, and one of them is right livelihood, which essentially means don't do anything immoral as part of your livelihood. Don't kill, don't harm anyone, don't steal, mm. don't misuse intoxicants, it's, uh, all, you know, all, all of these other things. And, you know, you offered this term moral injury to describe what these people are going through. Can you paint a picture for us? What does moral injury look like? What is someone who sits all day at a computer and kills people for a living? 
what does it look like? Yeah. So moral injury is a central concept in the book. And what I've tried to show in the book is that there are two sets of victims when dirty work unfolds. One set of victim are the targets, the people who suffer, the innocent civilians who might be struck in a an errant strike or the folks who are placed in solitary confinement for years on end. But there's a second set of wounds that take place, and that's to the people who do this dirty work. And these wounds are, are, are emotional and ethical because they are doing things that go against their uh, often go against their values or that require them to adjust their values, to silence some part of themselves, you know? And, and so yeah. it's not that every person I write about is anguished saying, oh my God, how could I do this? But what was so interesting to me is, you know, I talked to one warden at a jail and I mentioned this to him. I said, you know, what about the guys who are like, I'm fine with this. I, I love my job. I don't have any problem with, you know, mm -hmm. tossing these bad dudes and behind bars and roughing them up a little. I'm fine with that. And he said to me, those are the guys I worry about. What he meant was there's a very high rate of substance abuse, of suicide, of all kinds of health problems among prison guards. And he said, I'm worried about the guys who think there's nothing going on. But if you just observe a little bit, you'll see that, that they're not well. So moral injury is a term that military psychologists in the United States have increasingly used to describe the kinds of wounds that veterans of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars sustained. And what they found was that PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is the more common kind of military wound, it didn't actually describe what they were hearing from a lot of these veterans. Because at mm -hmm. least in the United States, PTSD, it's a traumatic brain injury due to exposure to a life-threatening event, like a roadside bomb. Mm. And it triggers these flashbacks and these recurrent fears, right? It's a fear-based yeah. thing. And what they were hearing, these psychologists, from a lot of the veterans was something else. You know, it was not, hey, I, you know, roadside bomb went off and it triggers me and I, I freak out. It's more... I keep remembering being at a roadside and the car was stopped because we thought there were some insurgents in it and we opened fire and then we saw that it was a family in that oh. car and I'm haunted by that. And so what is that kind of wound? And that's where moral injury comes in. It's oh. witnessing or participating in acts that go against your own core values and create this kind of rupture. And what's really interesting about the term, really in the last year or two, I would say, and as I hope my book is a part of this, it's starting to migrate. So you're seeing conversations about moral injury that go beyond the military realm towards all kinds of activities and jobs mm. that can cause this rupture, right? So we're hearing about moral injury among emergency medical providers. We're hearing about moral injury among some social workers and teachers. I actually think that to some extent, we all incur these injuries because that Buddhist principle is really hard to fulfill to its purest end. Yeah, this is really interesting um, to kind of take a, a sideline a little bit. But, you know, I, I, I worked for a couple of years in situations where I felt there were conflicts of interest where I was working at an agency that was supposedly serving the client, but we, you know, we actually knew that this, you know, this wasn't serving the client because they were making some error and then standing up to the client and letting them know that they're going the wrong path was too risky. We might lose that client. And so we were working under essentially the, the dogma, the, the obligation to not to do what the client wants and not what the client needs. And most, and sometimes I rebelled against it and spoke up. And sometimes it was too hard or it was too risky. And I, I, I got you know very clear message not to pursue this line. And I do think it affected me. I do think it made me a little bit less healthy, a little bit less happy, a little bit more conflicted. And eventually I left because I couldn't handle it anymore. It, this is a completely normal situation in the agency and consulting world. It's, a, it's an everyday situation. It's, it's so interesting to hear that because I think that we've become very cynical. And I think that the way we think about 
scenarios like the one you just described is people just do these things and don't think about it, right? In some ways, like the prison guard who's, yeah, I'm fine with this. I don't care. Um, but, oh, it's a white collar job. You're getting paid. Why would you care? Right. And let's just go on with, I think, in, in, in law, in consulting, in, in all of these fields, right? In, 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 in Silicon Valley, which I touch on in the last part of my book, you yeah. have these ethical questions starting to arise. What is the system for sucking up information on people who do Google searches really serving? Or what is this, this search design that China is going to be buying from Google or using with Google. What's going on here? What are the ethical implications? I think that the, the, the lazy analysis is people just don't care. They're cynical. But the part that interests me is the part that you described of yeah. how does it affect someone, even when they don't think it's affecting them? You know, yeah. And um, does it make you less excited about going to work every day? Does it make you oh, yeah. more cranky when you're home and does it make you more disconnected from your family and your kids and your friends what are the ramifications i think it's very uncommon for there not to be ramifications and we don't want to talk about it but i think they're there you're listening to remake a podcast about design, systems, and society. If you're listening on a podcast app, you already know how to follow podcasts. So please follow this one. If you're listening in a browser, just go to remakepod.org to find links to all the major podcast players where you can follow our show. Yeah, I, I'm analyzing a situation now in my head. It's apparently traumatic because it comes because I'm getting flashbacks when you're while you're talking about this. But we had a client come to us and say, "This is my life saving. I'm pursuing this dream, and I am terrified. So please, I'm relying on you to help me do the right thing." Mm-hmm. And then proceed to come up with a plan that was completely implausible. Anyone who knew something about the industry knew that they were going to lose all their money. And, you know, I I stood up for what I thought was something that they weren't seeing. And we had some tough conversations. And so I felt good about standing up and trying to do what's right for them. And then I was removed from the project. Suddenly, like all the Mm -hmm. meetings disappeared from my calendar. And it turns out that the client asked about me. It was like, no, we were like getting somewhere. But the company decided that I was rocking the boat too much. And so I was going to be moved to a different project. That was shortly before I finished my time there. And, and I, I wouldn't say that was the trigger, but it's... It, it, and in that moment, I felt like I, if I went along, after that speech of this is my life savings, I'm terrified, please help me. If I went along with using, burning up this money on a project that I knew could go nowhere... I would have to destroy something precious about myself. And I couldn't do it, but the rest of the team was fine with it. Obviously, the rest of the people stayed with that project. And maybe we're able to turn around later. I I don't know how it ended. So I think it's it's an interesting thing. So so I want to bring us back to these dirty jobs and the hidden nature of them. So how we're hiding them behind. They're always hard to access and hard to see. Why do you think that is? And give give us some color on that. Yeah. So part of it is geographic um, and physical. Hmm. I imagine most of your audience has at some point traveled through the United States, maybe lives in the United States, maybe visits occasionally. How many have approached or noticed and seen a prison Hmm. uh, or an industrial slaughterhouses? Now, these are not small institutions and there are thousands of them, but they're not easy to find. And that's by design. They are located in more remote areas. Prisons are often built and have been built and constructed in what one scholar calls rural ghettos, poorer areas of the United States that lost their factories and their mills. They needed something to keep the economy going. Oh, they built Mm -hmm. a prison. Industrial slaughterhouses, which used to be in 
major cities like Chicago these days, you have to go to very remote parts of the country, and then you have to find the back road, and then you have to go through a gate, and then you have mm. to probably circle past a few other things, and eventually, oh, in the distance you see, there is the Smithfield or Sanderson Farms slaughterhouse that's churning out thousands and thousands of sides of pork or bacon or whatever it is per mm. hour. And so hi hiding takes place that way. It's geographic design. And these are not, as I said, they're not only remote, they tend to be poorer. So you're not going to see these places next to Silicon Valley or Disneyland or Cambridge and Harvard. Uh, you right. have to go to the more down and out parts of the country. The second piece of, of the hiddenness is rules that prevent the public from knowing. So in the case of the drone program, I interviewed a number of people in that program, but we were not allowed to discuss operational details of anything. And that's because those details are classified. And then the third sort of systemic design part of the hiddenness are the internal filters in our minds that suppress what Everett Hughes mm. called the will to know, right? So mm. if you really wanted to know about the drone program in the United States, you could spend months reading about it just by going to your local library and ordering some books or just pressing print after some Google searches. You'll find reports from human rights organizations. You'll find national security reports. You just find a wealth of information. It's not actually impossible to know, um, mm. but how many people actually have the will to know? And that's right. the internal filter that is created in each person's mind to divert attention away from these things and focus on more pleasant things. In some of these dirty work, some of these jobs, you know, so, so other things comes to mind, right? The ICE, you know, immigration police, the, ten, the immigration detention centers, the police itself often finding themselves in morally compromised uh, situations, especially now with cameras exposing, everybody having a camera in their pocket and exposing what some of us knew, but the rest of us are now discovering that there's rotten policemen out there doing horrible things and uh, their colleagues must know about this, right? It, you know, it seems that the people in those situations, there's a big role for desperation, fear, um, a feeling of a last resort, this is the only job I can find? Or Is that what you find? How would you characterize the people who do these jobs? Yeah. So the dirty work that I looked at was largely, as you say, jobs of last resort. In other words, there are a lot of people in America who might want to be the chief of police in a town there are not a lot of people who want to be an entry-level prison guard at the local prison. That's mm -hmm. not a dream that people grow up with very often. Mm -hmm. Industrial slaughterhouses, working the kill floor, it's a job done largely by immigrants, many of them undocumented. It's not done by the sons and daughters of Ivy League graduates or senators. And mm -hmm. so there is a kind of class structure that shapes how this work is delegated and organized in the United States. And that is a big part of my book. And I think that's very important because it's another part of what makes it easy to tolerate. If we think back to the good people that Everett Hughes knew, and we think about who those quote unquote good people are in the United States today, you think of professionals and tolerant minded urban elites who mm. don't go to those remote towns where the prisons and slaughterhouses are and would look down on it if it's brought up in a dinner conversation, but they don't ever have to do it. It's just done for them by these mm. other people. And I think that the class d dimension, there's also a racial dimension to these divisions, plays a very big role in this kind of structure of dirty work. Mm. And you, you quote James Baldwin, the powerless must do their own dirty work the powerful have done for them. Yes. Which is a, a, a perfect statement. So I want to talk about the good people, and I'm, I'm using air quotes for the yeah. people listening. So the good people, let's give them the benefit of the doubt for this scenario. And let's say that there are, in fact, good people 
inside the society who, who do want to put a stop to it or find a better relationship to it, a more ethical relationship to the dirty work that's being done in their societies. What can they do? What, you know, at, at what point does the good people who keep themselves clean actually become clean, actually become ethical? Yeah, I mean, I think that a big part of it is exercising and building up that will to know and recognizing that these things are done to some extent with our tacit consent and possibly even to our benefit. And if that's the case, we have an obligation as a society to at the very least talk about these things, talk about what it means that we are tolerating this or letting it go on. And there was a lovely blurb I got from my book, but from the writer Rebecca Solnit, in which she said, the moral injuries belong to all of us, even though they're experienced solely by these people who dirty their hands. And I think that very powerfully captures what happens if as a society we collectively numb ourselves. In the case of, for example, the drone strikes in the United States, you were very right to point out earlier that this is not a policy of Republicans. This is not a policy of Democrats. This is a bipartisan policy. The mm -hmm. program was expanded massively under Obama, and then it was expanded even more under Trump. But to me, what's most disturbing about the drone program is that nobody talks about it. I wrote the book starting right before the 2016 election and finished it just after the 2020 election. So there were two presidential elections that took place in the United States. And there must have been dozens and dozens of these televised debates during these two races. And I kept mm -hmm. waiting for one question to be asked, just a question. Okay, you're president. What do you make of the drone program? Are you going to expand it or are you going to shrink it? Is it right that we're doing this? What are the consequences? Just one question about that. There were no questions, not one. And it wasn't the case actually with like Guantanamo, right? And the sort of black site prisons that, that arose after 9-11. Because there, I think people felt implicated in this. Like, ooh, this is, mm. this is dirty, there are photographs, there are, there's torture, there's these sort of interrogations going on, and it got massive amount of coverage, and there was a lot of discussion. But once it changed from, we no longer detain people, but we do occasionally zap them with drones, no more conversation. And yeah. that strikes me as a real ethical slippage as a society that we've made. And so mm -hmm. I think that the first obligation, the first step towards grappling with dirty work. It's like moral courage. You have to exercise it. You have to build up a, a willingness to do it. And I think just knowledge, the willingness to see these connections, to acknowledge them and to talk about the fact that these things are happening. Because once we stop talking about them, we've accepted it. Yeah. So, so you, you were born in Israel Mm -hmm. And you grew up in the States, but I wonder if you can help me uh, process what this means for Israel. So I've lived in Israel until I was 24, then I moved to the States for about a decade, and then I came back. And only once I came back did I even see the, the situation. So, so I think for many years I was so in the bubble that, uh, you know, it, it, it was a conflict, it, it was essentially war. And it's only after he came back that I started reading and getting interested and in understanding the structural aspects of occupation, what it means to occupy and what it means to have a generation of, you know, every generation of young people sent to those places. And Israel is interesting because there are many voices that are calling for change. There's this organization, Shuvrim Shtika, which is uh, breaking the silence, yeah. which is all about soldiers talk, talking about their experience in the, with the occupation, their traumas, their experience, what they've witnessed. And yet, in everyday society, if you read the news, if you talk to people, it doesn't exist. The occupation does not exist. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
and 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 I you know I'm, I I work in design in the tech industry. I have a podcast about design issues. It's very comfortable to sit here and not really think about what's going on. Probably just an hour drive from here. What can so besides reading books about it, you know, what's the right thing to do with a situation like that, is, which is not does not look like it's going to change anytime soon? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I've done some reporting on the issue. Obviously, I was born in Israel. I, like you, I grew up without understanding or questioning much. Probably the experience of being in the United States and, and, and being outside of, of the context of the conflict gave me a critical perspective. I'm not sure I would have had otherwise. In Beautiful Souls, I wrote about a soldier named Avner Wischnitzer, who was in the top unit of the Israeli army, Sayer Matkal, mm-hmm. and he ended up refusing to serve in the occupied territories. And he's someone who I hold up as a real moral example, but he is also someone with immense moral courage. And I'm not sure, you know, most people can meet him at, the, at, that, at that level of courage. But, but I guess mm-hmm. what I would say is that I think that the invisibility and the acceptance through various mental mechanisms that are not irrational, right? It's the, well, there's really no solution to the conflict. Both sides Mm. lack leaders that will actually talk to each other. It's such Mm. an intractable thing. And I've got kids, I've got a family, I've got a job, I want to go to the beach. Like, How much can I really change this? I vote, you know, I, I do what I can, but, you know, amatsav, the, the situation just goes on. Yeah. And that's not an irrational thought process. But within that thought process, there is a certain level of acceptance. This is just mm-hmm. going to continue. This is just going to go on. And mm-hmm. I think definitely, as you said, one of the reasons it can just go on is because even though the geography is very squeezed and it's close, you don't have to see it. You don't have to go there. There was an article I read once about where a, a journalist was talking about going from West Jerusalem to Ramallah, and he called it the longest 15 minutes or however, 45 minutes in the world. Because in Mm. that span, you're crossing all these barriers, right? You're crossing security barriers, but you're also crossing that sort of invisible lens and going to the other side. And I think it's very easy not to do that. Mm. I would say if I were trying to address an Israeli audience on this, I would start with moral injury. I would say, okay, let's Mm. assume that the people in this room disagree passionately about politics. Some are on the right, some are on the left, some are in the middle. But I bet you this society has a lot of people walking around in it that have witnessed or taken part in things that go against their core values when they've Mm. been in the occupied territories. And Breaking the Silence is one of the organizations that is trying to actually talk about that. Of course, people get angry at them for talking about it because it's very threatening to bring this up. But one of the reasons I think it's threatening is that it really hits home. It resonates at some deep place. I don't believe you can just have an occupation going on out there that, as you said, generations see it, participate, and then it it just disappears. We just go like this and go back to our our daily lives. There is a residue. There is obviously, for the Palestinians, a terrible cost for those who who are living under occupation. But it's implicating and affecting both the occupier and the occupied. That's where I would start. I think there is a, a universal yearning for basic freedom and basic dignity And if that is interfered with and suppressed and denied to people, it doesn't just go away. History Mm. shows us that it erupts in some forms. I grew up at the beginning of the Cold War, and no one thought that those East European societies would ever change. And then, boom, the spark was lit, and they collapse one after another. Apartheid, Mm. no one thought, oh, this is actually going to be defeated? Has all the power, has all the money, you know? It was defeated. And so, you know, I think that the the conflict won't go away until there is some just resolution, some better 
path forward. But in the meantime, I do think that it applies very much, this Everett Hughes model. If he were to spend a semester teaching in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv, I think he would be, he would revive, you know, he would add a little section to his essay saying, yeah. you know, this is what I see, you know. Yeah. And it's tragic that we, we went from being the victims of one side to being the perpetrator in another, not to say that these are equivalent in, in, in any factor, but really there is some sort of strange, uh, strange similarity. One of the writers I admire and, and talk about in my book is Primo Levi, extraordinary essayist and novelist, Italian Jew who survived Auschwitz. And um, one of Levi's main points is that we would love to believe that suffering and victimization ennobles you and makes you more virtuous, but it does not. Life is more complicated than that. And he learned that in the camps. And, you know, that lesson that he drew is, is one that I think about a lot. That's really interesting. I have to look it up. So I have two questions yeah. remaining. One is about dirty tech, what you call dirty tech in your chapter. So we're looking at the, the abuse of, of, um, of workers in, in companies like Amazon, you know, the bad conditions there. We're talking about I, the, the whole moderation problem in social media where people are seeing horrible things and have to kind of, to moderate them, to remove them, but they're exposed to it for hours. Most of them are contractors. They're not even employees of the company. And, and, and there's studies being done that, about their well-being that's really compromised. So where's the dirty work in tech? And or do you see any interesting trends around that or in anything that's changing? Absolutely. Um, well, I think the dirty work in tech is everywhere um, <laughs> right now, mm -hmm. un unfortunately. Um, but what's interesting is I went back and read some of the sort of journalism that was done about the tech world and Silicon Valley at the start. And it was the counterpoint to dirty, right? It was, there's the dirty fossil fuel industry, but there's the clean tech world. There's this just very appealing, these sleek computers and cellular phones and that, that are so miraculous. And the only mission here is to broaden access to information. What's wrong with that? It's all good. Enable you to watch great movies and purchase things. And there is a lot that's convenient and good that came of that. But I think we now see the dark side. We see mm. the way that these social media platforms can circulate propaganda and spread it. how, you know, the search engines are designed to suck up information about you as you're using them. So that suddenly on your phone, you're getting all these advertisements for things that, you know, is the phone reading my mind? Mm. No, but it's definitely full of tracking devices that are gathering information on you. And to go to the oil thing, uh, I talk a little bit about these tech companies designing programs to help fossil fuel companies extract oil and natural gas more efficiently. So there's this sort of merger. And what we thought was this clean world is full of compromise. What to me is very interesting is the consciousness of the workers in tech um, mm. changing. I write about a couple of Google workers, Google being a company that thought of itself as this, you know, our mission is to make the world a better place. And suddenly there were these controversies that erupted inside of Google about whether that's in fact the case. And mm. of course, it's happened at Amazon. Of course, it's happened at Facebook. So these tech giants that seemed unvarnished a decade ago, you know, they've fallen from grace and the workers who, who are on the inside are part of the reason for that because they're facing these moral dilemmas. Mm. Do I go along and am I here just because they pay me really well or because I believe in the mission? Yeah, and, and it's interesting because I think tech traditionally was a place that empowered workers. And that was the pitch. Come work for us, you'll be important, you'll be respected. And, you know, it, it will be fun to be at work. And the people there actually do expect that. And so when they run into a moral dilemma 
uh, like they did when Google was working on the, with the Defense Department on weapons, they stood up and said, I don't want to be part of this. This is not what I'm here for. So that gives me some hope, like you said. Yes. So I have a final question for you, which is our, our uh, usual closing question. So in his TED Talk, the philosopher Alain de Botton talks about the difference between a lecture and a sermon. He, a lecture being an informational, dry kind of way of delivering information, and, and, and you decide what you want to do with it. And a sermon, which he calls for more sermons, he longs for more sermons, is an urgent plea to change someone's life for the better. Mm-hmm. And so if you, let's say you could give a sermon to the world, <laughs> a short sermon, what would it be about? Wow. Um, it would be about bystanders and the layers of obfuscation and indifference that lead us to avert our eyes. Because I think that the easy explanation for the great tragedies and social harms we read about is just a bunch of bad people, corrupt folks got together and did this. And the corruption is real. And in some cases, that scenario is exactly true. But I think that it's the tolerance for it among the quote unquote good people, the ways that we find other things to think about or to focus on. And um, it would be hard for me to give a sermon because I'm a reporter uh, and, and, Mm -hmm. and, and my tendency is probably towards the other. But that's what I would want to focus on to, to shake us out of those habits of obfuscation and indifference and averting our eyes. Thank you very much, Eyal. It was a pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you so much. It was really enjoyable to be part of this conversation. Remake is produced by myself and Regina Rothstein. Research and editing by Louis Brady and audio engineering by Greg Cocoveos. If you enjoyed the podcast, please consider writing a five-star review in Apple's podcast or wherever you're listening. It helps many more people discover the podcast and also just makes us feel good. Current support for the podcast comes from my own design company, Remake Labs. We're a global strategic design speed agency aimed at improving outcomes through repeated and rapid design interventions. Now, until next time, be well, everyone, and see you next week on Remake.